This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. ago, I was reading this paper, a piece of scholarship, let's call it. We're going to spend a fair amount of time on some of its bigger ideas towards the end of this episode, actually. So I don't want to say too much about it, except I will say that it was called the semi-ohm, from genetic to semiotic scaffolding. And it proposes the idea of, you guessed it, the semi-ohm. The author, Jesper Hoffman, defines that as, everybody get ready, the entirety of an organism's semiotic tool set, i.e. the means by which the organisms of this species may extract significantly meaningful content from their surroundings and engage in intra- or inter-specific communicative behavior. Ugh. Now, despite the seeming impenetrability of some of this, it really got me thinking, and thinking, as you might not be surprised to learn, entirely out of my depth about the relationship between communication, the way that animals, ourselves included, create signs, and their very low-level biology. Unfortunately, however, the last biology class I had was in 2002, and the last biology text that I read was The Selfish Gene, and I really only remember that one chapter about memes, of course. What luck, though, that my pal, Joe Hansen, a biologist, happened to be in town from Austin, Texas this week, and he was willing to let me barrage him with all manner of questions about sound-making animals and what happens when we consider certain biological processes, like the ones that have led us to possess control over our sound-making apparatus, as creating meaning in and of themselves. Which is how I have taken admittedly, perhaps completely incorrectly, to be the thesis or theme of Jesper Hoffman's paper. What follows is a conversation between me and Joe about whales, mice, parrots, and nothing short of what it all means, man. So I'm here with um, Mr. Joe Hansen. Hi. Uh, who is the host of um, a YouTube show uh, about science that is super good. It's okay to be smart. I'm gonna, I'll let you explain who you are and what the show is. Mike and I are kind of co-workers. We make YouTube shows for, for PBS Digital Studios. Mine's called It's Okay to Be Smart. It's just like a fun look at science and how the world works and kind of a silly but, but important way. I, I invited Joe over because um, Joe is a is a biologist, PhD biologist. That's right. So I want to make sure that I give you your credit, give you if your you could due. Refer to me as Doctor Joe for the rest of the podcast. Doctor be... Doctor Joe Hansen is here joining us on Reasonably Sound. I wanted to talk to Joe about animal sounds and animal noises and the complicated and possibly really uninteresting, but we're going to approach it at the end of this podcast anyways. Idea about whether or not those things mean something like when an animal makes specific kinds of sounds on purpose does it have meaning and is that somehow related to its biology am i summarizing I think that captures what we're going to try to do gonna pretty tr well yeah we're going to try to do it so we're going to go through a couple examples of animals creatures that m make certain kinds of sounds on purpose um and then at the end we're going to try to pull it all together 
and we'll we'll see how it goes. But I think the first place that we want to start is there's a there's a distinction that you wanted to make that I think is really interesting and really important. So oh, yeah, so over the past half century, maybe maybe a little bit longer, we've started to realize that there isn't just this distinction, this binary distinction of things that make noises that mean something and things that don't. We don't have these sort of black and white kind of distinctions. So like we think of, you know, when when people make a noise using their mouth, we're going to we're going to think of that as having lots of meaning. And when um a squirrel makes that really weird chirping noise that they make when they're upset, we think of that as meaning. Like that's just that doesn't mean anything. That's just just angry about something or We've learned this in so many different parts of biology, whether it's the fact that we're not the only things that use tools, the fact that we are not the only things that cook and prepare our food. So many different aspects of what we used to kind of look at as that's our special human stuff. Right. It's, it's made us more part of the animal kingdom, but in doing so increased our understanding of, of how we of how we work. And vocalizations and sounds are part of that. And, you know, I think one of my favorites, because it's it's so ill understood and so mysterious because it happens in the ocean is the humpback whales uh humpback whales make these incredibly intricate and complex and deep and like long songs half an hour songs that have verses and have very intricate rhythms and could be as some biologists have said the most complex songs in the animal kingdom so they so they actually have an identifiable structure because i know we at least i always think of whale song in the maybe like new agey sense of the thing that you listen to that's just this constant droning kind of oh, i think of it in the in the finding nemo sense like but the <laughs> <laughs> right uh but yeah the they they certainly do it and this is done i mean scientists don't study whale songs by looking at you know it's not musical notation this is frequency analysis right, and, yeah. and, and things so there are certain patterns and there are repetitions and there are definitely pieces of these songs that we can you know maybe it's an analogy to call it a, a verse the whale's not sitting down going i need a bridge <laughs> <laughs> but they but they certainly have structure and they have a, an ex, a serious complexity to them and are there like are there distinct or maybe discrete is the right word um songs like are there songs that get moved between whales or between are they called pods is that what it is Pod- yeah they, they they travel in in their pods and so pacific humpbacks are, are famous for this males use mating calls and uh, males actually go in between groups of females and they'll show up to an area and that, that mating song the males will all sing the same song what? and compete with that song uh, to to woo the females. So what you're saying is that they all know Wonderwall. They all know Wonderwall. <laughs> uh, and so a new whale will show up. Will, will, if he didn't have a successful year, maybe he goes off to a new area and he can carry that song with him to a new group of whales who have never heard it before and pass that on. And then it'll do a little bit of, it'll evolve a little bit among that population. But this is cultural transmission of a song in the animal kingdom and when those when they move around do they learn they can learn the song or the structure of the communication of the different you know the different pods different groups of whales yeah you imagine that like without music learning a 30 minute song (laughs) all the intricate changes of uh, while swimming and holding your breath the entire time too they so they they can they do teach these things to each other they do they they hear and yeah. mimic and learn and and practice these songs until they've mastered them for the next season and so what you're saying is that this this sort of shows that there's a space between uh, like a gorilla grunt which is a you know a sound that will be made through the exertion of we'll call it an utterance, an utterance. that's a word that, that that's used yeah so an utterance something that just kind of happens and doesn't really have much intention or meaning and, and then on the far other end of the spectrum is like us having this conversation right now and that the whale song is it, it falls in there in the middle yeah because probably even it seems closer to what we're doing right now than an, a simple utterance yeah i think so i mean there there's there's intent and there is uh there's an expectation of response and there's a des- there's a desired effect for that action mm-hmm. this song i want it to do something i want it's it's this is to impress this is to woo a female for mating this is a competition to perform the song yeah it, there's definitely meaning in there and is that like where 
where does that come from? It, like how, like how does that, how does that develop? Because it can't just be cultural, right? I mean, we, I don't know a lot about whale culture. Unfortunately, we haven't translated right. all the songs. <laughs> But yeah, the, nobody knows what the where this comes from. Whales are incredibly hard to study. They live in the ocean, and unfortunately, when they die and uh, and they fall to the bottom of that ocean in order, uh, so it's hard. Which to, I've heard is is pretty deep and it's deep and, and a little scary. Dark. <laughs> Did you see that this is not sound related or whale related at all? But someone just fished out a four hundred toothed being of some kind by mistake. That they're saying that is, is a, essentially a living fossil, which is a terrifying thought to me. Don't get me started on that term living fossil. <laughs> Do you want to just summarize your feelings in two words? Not okay. Utter bullshit. Utter bullshit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So whales die and... So it's hard to study their brains because they're down at the bottom of the ocean. That's And that's how we... That's one of the tools that scientists use to decipher what's happening in science to see do they share what do they share in terms of the structure and how things are organized and how things are expressed and you can't stick a whale in an MRI machine and and see what's happening on the inside we might be able to build one soon but I don't know. Like, <laughs> oh man a really big one what's that's um no one would be able to wear any jewelry for um a thousand square kilometers yes exactly I Sounds like a bad X Men plot there. Magneto's whale research lab turns out as a weapon the whole time. So that brings us to, I think, the next thing that we were, that we wanted to talk about which is singing mice <laughs> i can mm -hmm. transition have you seen that movie an american tale it's just like that <laughs> uh so this is when we get, we get into sort of some higher level easier to understand smaller cuter right. singing animals and uh, the, the connection here is there's we're, we're gonna we're talking about brains yes yeah so we're trying to figure out why these animals and how these animals make control process transmit these intricate songs that they create right and this is this is going back to the thing that we were talking about before that we think of ourselves as being the the sort of masters of intention and agency and that because of our big brains and self-awareness we're the only ones who are able to put put these things together put intentional sounds and messages together but that it it seems like we can we can point to parts of brains in other animals that say well, maybe not so much. So in a, in a special mouse, and this humble little mouse is when we have found a a, a humbling uh, epiphany, which is that uh, it identified as a special gene, one special gene uh, in, inside of, of of this mouse's genome called FOXP2. Okay, and this has been this has been identified in a number of species. We have it, mice have it, all you know, a lot of m mammals have it, all the way back down to uh, you know, things like birds. Okay. In this gene seems to be a master control gene to allow us to to mold our brains to learn songs to and to be able to remember and process them. Think of this. There's this word called neuroplasticity. Okay. Which is our ability to sort of wire and rewire different parts of our brains. Is it, that's what happens in learning. That's what happens in understanding our environment and mapping. And FOXP2 seems to be this master control gene involved in uh, the ability for us to, to do that. And is it is it so it is for neuroplasticity as a whole, not f just sound related? Well, it seems to be very specific to sound and oh, language, actually. Okay. So right. it, if you take humans who have, you know, a mu mutation in this gene okay. or, or these singing mice, if they have a mutation in that gene, all of a sudden lose the ability to do their special ultrasonic uh, mating songs. Okay. And humans that have a deficiency in that gene also have no ultrasonic mating songs. No, no ultrasonic mating songs, <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> Semisonic mating songs. Um, but the, yeah, they, they lose the ability to, to communicate and process language effectively. What? I don't want to, I don't want to go off on too far a tangent, but I cannot help but veer at least for a moment to imagine um, uh, an X man, an X X man, X person who's mutation is in the fox p2 gene like what what is if if people were to have a super fox p2 gene like overdeveloped other than ultrasonic mating sound 
I think he would be the master interpreter yeah. or something. It would, it would just be it would be Google Translate that already exists. Yeah, or we or, or or Foxman could could learn could learn whale song in one sitting. He would just speak like a whale, right? That take forever. <laughs> so then, so then we found this in a a mouse. Found it in a mouse, or well, it does. It's something been studied sp- in mice because okay. it just turns out mice are kind of easy to study right. because they're small, cute. They breed pretty fast. Scientists like them for that. Uh, so yeah, so we've been able to look at what this gene does in the brain, and it turns out it's not just it. It has a physical manifestation. It, it builds the brain in a certain way, and we start to uncover that these mice have almost like vocal circuits in mm-hmm. their brain. That, that there's there's a, a a pathway of signaling that happens that's very particular that hinges on this gene FOXP2 to allow them to communicate this way. Wow! And we and we taught them to sing. They sing on their own. This is just part of their... We, scientists for a long time didn't know they did it because it was, it was out of the human hearing range. Oh, okay. So, but if you have a... If that's you, the ultrasonic mating yeah, call. that's right. the ultrasonic mating call. And uh, but and scientists were able to, you know, in quiet forests, they have microphones near the ground. You can you can pick this up on, on, on special recording equipment that you're like, wow, there's mice singing all around us. And we never knew the whole time because it's just outside of our range of hearing. I like to imagine, um, I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that you weren't about to conclude this by saying that we taught a bunch of mice to sing like Beyonce songs, but <laughs> what's up, babe? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's just, no, there's one of the other ones reminders. I just kind of wonder if they're whispering behind her back or something the whole right. time. Like, oh, here come the guys in the oh, coats God. again. What are they, the microphones start singing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it, so it really is a similar kind of intention and message to the whale song or probably one use of the whale song that there it's this the mating call putting a putting a communication together to send out a message to a like a larger group because it's not it sounds like it's not one-on-one it's groups communicating to groups or it's like one mouse communicating to a larger group and then this is when we get into how we have to think think about the way that, that all the things that we do unconsciously when we're speaking and singing and communicating we are actively controlling this little voice box and all of the intricate muscle work that goes into making these shapes. Yeah. So can they like, take me through it step by step that there so there's Fox P2. Yes. And it is a gene that allows control of certain musculature and other parts of the body to create like so, language, but like, what is the step by step that happens? So we've, we we see Fox P2 is expressed in a certain part of the brain that is a computing center, if you will, or like a processing center for for these vocalizations and and the the intention and what they mean and 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 how they're learned. This it reaches out into all kinds of language processing, but from that part of the brain, when it is activated, it shoots off into the part of the brain that controls motor control. And just the same way that you want to you want to think about lifting up your right arm, you have signals from the right arm lifting control part of your brain that say up. In that, in that motor control part of the brain is a part that controls your vocal cords. And that's an active thing that we do that we're just not conscious of because we're so used to doing it. So we can draw this sort of as a circuit diagram in the brain if you want to. Think about it, nice electrical engineering. And in that, we can, we can start to say, does it line up with other brains that we're used to, like maybe our own or other animals out there that we know we have a hunch have some pretty advanced vocalizations? So that there's a, there's a motivation there in our our part, right? That we that we we're controlling how these sounds come out, and we never would have anticipated that mice are also making these same sort of neural decisions, if you want to like look at it that way. But right. That they're that they have some sort of control based on this one special gene that we all share. Right. This, this circuit inside of our brains. So this so it's kind of like saying that there's that there is there's a, a potential for putting these kinds of things together in in every animal that has both the gene and the like physical tool set the 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 muscles and the I don't know larynx or yeah exactly yeah. it's 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 the motor control of the larynx like yeah it's 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 think of it as being coordinated enough to control that. And yeah, anywhere that we find this, we might find so, that means that animal might fall somewhere on this new continuum that we're thinking about it now. It's not a has language or doesn't or is able to communicate using sound mm-hmm. with intention or doesn't. Everything falls in this spectrum now, and uh, it, it sort of shows how much we share. 
The other thing I'm also wondering is, like, are there whales and mice and, uh, you know, other animals that show this kind of communication to, where they to talk to one another, where it's it's a back and f- it's a conversation between just two of them as opposed to sending out a signal and hoping to get a return dolphins are famous for this like okay we got dolphin chirps and buzzes and all those things we think sound cute and flipper and everything um they they identify themselves as with a call they're like hey it's hey it's me hey hey it's me joe yeah i think i always say whenever my whenever my dog barks i always just think of him as saying hey 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 hey." isn't there a far side cartoon about that i think (laughs) i think actually there is hey 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 yeah Man, they must really be saying hi to the mailman. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So I mean, they, there are dolphins that they, they call out to each other, and they they are they're expecting you know they're expecting a response. They but they're just identifying themselves using this vocalization. And is that and and is there like there is a kind of back is there a back and forth where it's you know one one dolphin says hey I'm Jeff and another dolphin says hey uh, I'm Sandy. Yeah, they that they, they there's a call and response just to say, do we know each other? Yeah, then maybe they remember then. That's so. That's very cool. Yeah, we won't use the N word though, the the name, but we don't want to go that far. But there's some identification call. That we'll right, they're doing it's a, um a signal of some sort. Yes, <laughs> don't we have general terms in science? Yeah. <laughs> I also, um, I, I feel like we're, b- before we move on to birds, because I think we want to talk a little bit about birds. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't want to move away from Fox P2 without asking if it is named that way because of the what does the fox say. I feel like the, the connection here is just to... What does the fox P2 say was just a little too long, so they shortened that out for the video. Right, yeah. yeah. Also, doesn't the fox just say yip? Of course. Yeah, like that's, I don't know, I find that... Music video. I mean, it's very. I understand the appeal of it. Actually, the after Fox the video just, came out, uh, you know what foxes say now? What, what do they say now? So can I, I want to tell you a story about my aunt's parrot from many years ago. They don't have this parrot anymore. Uh, it was called Betty Boop. Of course it was. It's a, a male parrot. A macaw? Is that? Yep. Yeah. The like bright red. Well, you know what kind it was, but yeah, that's not, that is a parrot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Joe, tell me about my aunt's parrot. Mm, I'm seeing red. And it would do this thing where it would imitate the sound of their phone which had a really particular ring so it learned the phone ring and then my uncle would go to answer the phone and the parrot would see when my uncle went into the kitchen to get the phone and then it would imitate my aunt's laugh so it was playing jokes as far as we could tell it was playing jokes on my family members so the first thing that i that i that i just want to throw out there is well what 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 it blows my mind what even is happening in that (laughs) like so i've heard these stories about um alex the gray parrot that really like very very smart african gray parrot that could could tell jokes and did also did something else like was could be deceptive or something and they were saying that this is this is a, a, such a high order of intelligence that we should start considering them non-human persons well there's a whole thing to, to... but i just i want to ask whether or not this you you see this level of um like message creation and seeming intention, you know, like using the vocal cords to produce these sounds that it knows has a meaning and then responding in a way that to us at least seems to indicate intelligence. Like, is that intelligence? Well, that's a that's a, a word that's just got so many different definitions that it's certainly like there's some kind of intelligence there. Like right. the ability to process the these noises I'm making have parts and pieces, and when I apply them together in certain order, like something happens that I get a reaction out of. Yeah. Right. We don't know if the bird thinks it's funny. We don't know if the bird is just looking for a cracker, or if it just likes when the human comes back in the room. Like, right. I don't know, but, but yeah, there's clearly something going on there that's way more than say, um, 
you know, the pigeon making that horrible pigeon noise right. as it searches for garbage. <laughs> Um, I mean, I ask, I also want to, I also ask this knowing that you were just at a, you were at an artificial intelligence conference, conference. a whole conference for artificial intelligence. And this was something that, that came up the idea of, was it deception being a sign of, yeah, it is deception a sign of intelligence? Because famously, if we look at the, about computer machine intelligence, famously last year, allegedly a computer beat the Turing test, which is, you know, this sort of nebulous question mark threshold of when a computer becomes intelligent. Uh, invented by famous mathematician and code breaker Alan Turing, uh, developed by him in, in the 1950s. But this computer, this it was a chat bot. So you would you would ask it questions uh, over, you know, you're, you're, you're chatting with it on the internet and it would respond to you. And the idea was, could humans to tell if this was a computer or a real person this was this was the clever bot right this was a clever bot yeah yeah there's a lot of great if you go and google clever bot there's all kinds of awesome people freaking out last year about the idea though that artificial intelligence research is like no this isn't really intelligence that the act of deception according to this community is not intelligence okay because to deceive the humans it pretended to be a 13 year old ukrainian boy with a limited provisions in english so the cleverness, the deception was deflecting answers. Right, essentially, and, essentially admitting some sort of deficiency and then relying on our, our accepting of it in some way. You know, you ask it, how many legs does a camel have? And it would say, well, more than two and less than eight, but I'm not really sure because I don't speak English good. <laughs> right. Like, that's not an excuse. Yeah. And so most, it's very clever, though. Very clever. Shaking your fist at that chat bot. Stupid clever bot. So yeah, the question of if if this uh, constitutes intelligence, open, okay, but probably no. And so then, is there? So then, how does this relate to the mice and the whales? Like, is this a we're we're talking? So we're talking about Fox P two, and we're also talking about um, the sort of the the toolbox that's inside of the the head and face and throat of these animals. Let's think about how a gorilla wants to communicate to us. It makes a really guttural, loud, diaphragm-driven grunt. Right. Uh, uh, uh. But there's no there's no effort to control it, to, to nuance it, to put it into, to assemble it into larger messages. It's not it's not going to imitate the phone ring, is what it's, you're saying. Well, yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, the, in a parrot, or say, in or like we saw in whales and mice, there's this ability to use that connection from the brain to the motor control to the vocal cords to sort of nuance and control and assemble this message into something more complex mm -hmm. and that's what we see in the parrot and so it's there's that intent and that design well yeah motivation to right there's in the, like this is something i mean i i think you know i could do an entire probably five episodes of this podcast on bird song and mimics and the way that all of that works but it's like what is it that allows you know like i have to work really hard to do an impression of like a turkey or a cat like i have to think about it and i can't i'm not just going to do it like i'm i'm going to have to to practice but the parrot and these, these certain birds like the birds that um the name of it is escaping me right now but there is this bird that has learned to imitate the sound of the machinery that is destroying its own environment the lyre bird the lyre bird which is it blows like wh how and it does it so convincingly the it's, saddest part of that is the lyre bird probably thinks it's answering some really cool and innovative other lyre bird that just happens to be a bulldozer oh no that is very big yellow lyre bird that is I don't understand. very sad <laughs> but is that like is is that is that some great um capability of the brain of the vocal apparatus of the connection between the two it's all of that okay it, it's it's taking that that idea that that singing mouse and that um the the parrot all of these things, and maybe the whale, if we were to look inside of their brain, have sort of this shared architecture mm. that just the complexity of which changes along this continuum of things that use controlled vocalizations to communicate or to 
you know, to signal and expect a response. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's taking this basic sort of scaffolding and it what and, and what we build on top of it. Okay. So now I think we're at, we're we're getting to we're at the place where we're going to really get into the weeds. Oh boy. So Bring we're gonna, your machetes, folks. <laughs> we're going to talk about semiotics for a little bit. But so the first thing I want to do is let's let's talk for a second about what semiotics is. So semiotics is is the study of um, like the process of signs. So it's it's kind of like um, when you see something and you think of a reference, you think of it as referencing something. The process by which you connect that thing that you've seen to the thing that you see it referencing. That's semiosis. It's just connecting connecting signs to reference, right? Right. So we're seeing, so it's it's like looking looking at a sign, thinking about what it means. And that's really what we've been talking about the entire time here. We've been talking about animals um, and to a certain degree, people as a subset of animals, creating signs using using their vocal cords and using, um, the capability that's given to them uh, for controlling those vocal cords, using their brains to create signs, to have an intention, the hopes that those that those signs that they're making are going to do something in the brains of other animals. Yeah, a way of inviting a shared experience. And we're very conscious, and I, no one would argue that we have intention and agency, if you will, to control this uh, motivated conscious decisions that I'm going to communicate with Mr. Michael Rugnetta right, right now using all of these various permutations of my vocal cords. So if that's happening here and we see the same circuitry inside of the brains at different levels of complexity in that singing mouse, in, in all of these birds, in the parrots, in, in other songbirds, then where do we, what do we do with that? How far back do we pull that agency into right. that level of complexity. And so Joe and I both read this paper, um, the author of which is currently escaping my mind, but I will put a link to it in the show notes on um, infiniteguest.org, um, was saying that his, his kind of thesis was that any kind of agency that exists in an organism to want to continue to exist um, can only be described by natural selection to a, to a point. Yeah, it's it's the ability to want to exist is complicated and te- and, and 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 tenuous. We have to be really careful with this because most of the machinery that makes up life is free of desire, is free of of you know DNA is a chemical. It doesn't want to do anything. Um, the act of natural selection takes away things that are that that don't work as well that have inefficiencies etc but this idea where where biology starts to get very complicated and um incomplete is what is motivating this change and what's right. motivating that that animal to get to the next generation and so and so this paper is making the claim that the that there is a semiotic process so there is a process that that is actually part of the biology, part of the very low level cellular operation where there are certain kinds of cells that reference something. And in a biological process, the reference is resolved to an actual referent. So like something that has that has a meaning that is instantiated through the process. And so that in some way is the very very low level biological reason that that we want and that we create these signs to that we then hope to have like you were saying shared experience that it's sort of part of part of not only our biological makeup but part of the biological process that signs and sign systems are the way that animals want to communicate if yes, if we're de- if we're delivering signs here through our vocalizations and what they represent to each other, well, the argument in this paper is that is a chemical, a sign that can be referenced by the receptor on the cell that that is go- that it's that it latches into to say start some other cellular process inside of the cell. Are these you know, hormones or 
molecules in the environment that they're sensing are these signs as well that that are being tra you know translated uh, through their referent, which would be that receptor or something like right, that. Right, that there's that there's some sort of meaning that they have that is unexpressed, and through this process, it it gets translated and then. The, the actual biological word is transcribed, right? Is that... Right. Well, and that has to do with exactly how, you know, this inert thing, DNA. If you put DNA in a... In a, in a we have jars of DNA <laughs> right. in okay. labs everywhere. Right. They're not... We would never point to it and say, well, that's alive. <laughs> but it's, it's when that is a... That's just codified information. It has to be acted upon by... It, the act of transcription is what turns it into something we call RNA, which is a, a related molecule, which is kind of like, if you go to the library, the books that you're referencing are the DNA. They're all sitting there on the shelves. The notes you take out of those books, out of the parts that you need and want, are your RNA. And then the essay that you combine those notes into and create something new is the protein or something that's going to go do work inside the cell. Right. And that's the action. So that act of transcribing is taking that inert, codified information and making an, sort of an intermediate signal that you can go on and translate into something else. Right, and so we could see then working in the opposite direction as the semiotic process that the essay is referencing the notes, which references the source, which references all kinds of things that are out there in the world, right? So that is the semiotic process. So what do you feel? What do you think about this, this idea that, that this process of creating, creating these signals... Um, the the desire the intention that we've been talking about to to whale song to mouse sing to uh parrot I imitate however however you want to say it is in some way inspired by or caused by the 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 biological process you know it's it, when we start distilling these things down so we've tried to distill some of the parts of language and vocalization down to how a protein acts and how certain cell circuits inside of the brain do it. Well, and if we start taking apart those cell circuits, well, we find a number of individual cells of different types. And if we take that cell apart, then we're going to, we're going to dig that down, chisel it down to the proteins and, and the, the, the enzymes and the DNA and the, and the, and everything that makes up that cell's physical structure. Well, then if we start saying, well, what does that DNA code carry inside of it? We're, we're, we keep diving down a tunnel mm -hmm. of, of, of different scales of complexity. And the real question is when we're dealing with this question of agency and intent and motivation to communicate, how far down can we continue to divide this before we reach the ultimate level, its ultimate source? It does that exist. Right. And, and, and at what point are you getting to the sort of the dangerous side of biological determinism, right? Do you, right. how much of these things is it even responsible to ask or wonder if it is biologically determined? Cause I'm just a bag of chemistry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What does it matter what I do for anything that at that point we can get it down to DNA and, and what do we do with that inert molecule? We seem to run into this wall in biology that when, once we hit this, this molecule is just a, a codified information how does how is that born into the 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 will and agency to we're using communication here but to to make more of our species and to to uh, provide evolution with the freedom that it needs to tinker with us yeah. which is you know uh, you know the thing about the thing about the semiotic process that i think might rescue it from this this seemingly dangerous idea of biological determinism you know that like the biology is behaving in a certain way and so that determines the way that we as much more complex organisms are behaving um is that the semiotic process is uh, it, um is an inherently subjective one that when you are interpreting the meaning of signs you know there are some things that are very clearly what they are like they're they're trying to communicate something that is that is um, explicit is maybe the right word, but that a lot of times, uh, sort of like with the whale song, you know, it's not explicit. It's, it's a thing that is very much open to 
like it's a general meaning um, or we can we can guess you know there's some interpretation that's involved and i think that most of the semiotic process of moving from the sign to what it means or to what it is referring it's incredibly subjective and so then maybe the question to ask is whether or not in this biological process that we have just described as being semiotic or showing some characteristics of semiosis you know is the question is there some subjectivity and i know that there's like there's there's randomness like there are random mutations that get incorporated or not via evolution but i don't know if that's i don't know if that's a connection there yeah i don't think i don't know if the randomness connects to this this question of when we're looking at the whale song we're listening to the whale song we're trying to say to ascribe it to a meaning because that's how we connect it back to that whale's agency trying to figure out maybe the question is we're trying to figure out what that whale was trying to do with that sign because we don't understand what it's what it's referring to for that whale so then we do try to distill it down to this almost this 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 shared structure nature this does it share the genes does it share those brain circuits but there i think there is a subjectivity in that we are unable to share in it uh the deciphering of that sign. We mm -hmm. can only apply it to our own rules. So in order to give ourselves evidence and ground to stand on in applying it to our rules, we try to look for these other shared aspects of it, whether it's the, the neural circuits or the genes or the the shared motor control in our vocal cords. Right. And I guess, I guess in, in some way, if, if you know, the, the things that um, seem attractive from the ground up of looking at a biological process and trying to describe it as semiotic and then working from that direction um, towards the way actual whole complex organisms behave is a thing that is a, a little bit a little bit scary and that and that working looking at it from the top down looking at the subjective nature of the interpretation of these things, trying to apply it to the way that we think of signs and sign systems, um, looking at that sort of in interpretive process and, and going from the top to the bottom and then trying to look at biology as a thing that is not determined, that is subjective in some way, that is random, is maybe something that, for us at least, is a little bit less scary. Do you th is that do you think that that's I think so, you know I think so it nobody wants to it, it I think it's very uncomfortable in a in a maybe an existential sense for humans to to think of themselves as just the actions of really really complex piles of chemistry for real but biology is attacked attacks this problem from two sides you've got you've got biologists that that look at individual proteins and chemical reactions and try to add them together and see if we can integrate complexity out of that. There's a field called systems biology that's using incredibly powerful computers to try to assemble all the chemical reactions and see what how they build networks and if something starts to come out of that. But then you have people who go into the African savanna and uh, or into the rainforest and just look and listen to the macaw and see how the behavior and the very top level uh, effect of all you know how that's manifested in the whole animal and and then they they, they try to dig into it from that direction the question is where and if they're going to meet in the middle right and and in the process you don't want to it's uh, at least from the outside this is how i feel as a non-biologist that uh, sometimes it can feel like it, it's um seeing you know this uh, like seeing sausage made you know, like it's like looking a little bit too much into the process. And then the other side, you don't want to you don't want to gild the lily and you don't want to be like, well, everything is a beautiful and a special snowflake that is its own particular and amazing little deal. We share so much, but we share 98, 99 percent of our DNA with chimpanzees. Our brains are built pretty much the same way. They've got pretty much the same genes and information to call upon but it feels like we can do a heck of a lot more. And where does that come from? Yeah. Well, we, we covered a lot of ground. We started at um, 30, 30 minute whale songs 
and ended up at um, the bi- meaning of life. The meaning of life, biological determinism. Um, and, uh, anyway, uh, here's Wonderwall. Thank you so much for coming by, Mr. Johansson. Thanks for having me, Mike. Um, And remind us where we can find you on all of the internets. You can find me on YouTube, It's Okay to Be Smart. Uh, Spelled out. Spelled out. Okay, A-Y. You can find me on Twitter at JTP Izzo, It's Okay to Be Smart.com. And Mike will put all these links in the show notes. I will put all of those links in the show notes. All right, Joe, thank you so much again. Thank you. After we recorded this, Joe and I stood around in my studio for a good while with a couple Miller High Lifes and wondered whether or not we'd actually um, said anything. Clearly, the question is big and weird and is maybe a symptom of this academic desire to place ideas with little or no relation next to one another in order to stake out some uncharted territory as your own. I don't know. My gut says that there is something here and that we are just scratching on some very bizarre surface. We gave up and we talked about guitars for a little while, as you do. The next day, Joe, after having boarded a plane headed back to Austin, sent me a text which included a photo of a passage of a book. Um, And the text said, Ugh, that paragraph across the page. If only I could have said exactly that yesterday. And then he, well, actually here, I'm just going to let Joe tell it how it happened. So I'm on the plane flying back to Austin and... I pick up this book, Arrival of the Fittest, by evolutionary biologist uh, Andreas Wagner, and I I turn the page, and there he is talking about exactly what we've been talking about. So I couldn't resist adding one more thing. Um, Wagner's trying to answer this question that eluded Darwin. Darwin's theory of natural selection gave us the idea of, of survival of the fittest, but no one's been able to answer the question of where those adaptations come from. What is the arrival of the fittest? And Wagner has spent uh, decades researching this and used this analogy of, of evolution exploring this universal library, these texts that it can call upon and test to solve problems. And it's just so fitting because these are actual texts, the, the, the letters of DNA, and this is pure information and what they're written into, that meaning, which is, is proteins and, and things that do things inside of the cell. But if we look at this from the, the perspective of semiotics, then the sign is is the text in the DNA or the amino acid sequence of a protein. But the meaning is is what it does, what its what its function is. The word that we use is phenotype. And in evolution, things that work are meaningful. Things that work better are more meaningful, and things that have lost their function have lost their meaning. Um, So who knows? I mean, evolution has only had time to explore the tiniest corner of this universal library. So I guess we'll wait and see. For anyone who's curious, the passage that Joe read in that book says the following. Cells take a hard-nosed view on which proteins are meaningful, those that help them live. A protein is meaningful only if it is useful and defective mutant proteins that do not fold properly have lost their meaning. If a protein's meaning feels too anthropocentric a word, it's worth reminding ourselves how meaning is defined by semiotics, an offshoot of linguistics that explores the meaning of meaning. Whatever a sign, which could be anything from a road sign to a book's text, points to, if that sign is a protein's amino acid text, then... The meaning it encodes is the protein's phenotype and the function it serves inside of a cell. My name is Mike Rugnetta. 
And this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram and Twitter at ReasonablySND. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at Mike Rugnetta. You can and should find Joe Hansen at youtube.com forward slash it's okay to be smart, it's okay to be smart.com, and on Twitter at J2VIZO.